And welcome to Always Take Notes. A message from our sponsor, Curtis Brown Creative. If you're an aspiring author, you'll be excited to hear that this week's sponsors are Curtis Brown Creative, the renowned writing school run by the major literary and talent agency. Since launching in 2011, over 200 of their students have gone on to get major book deals. CBC run a wide range of courses covering a variety of topics and genres. If you're interested in bringing your true stories to the page, why not join their six-week online writing a memoir course with exclusive teaching videos, resources, and writing tasks from best-selling author Kathy Rensenbrink. By the end of the course, you'll have written at least the first 3,000 words of your memoir and developed a plan for the rest of the book. Plus, all students will be given the opportunity to get individual feedback from one of CBC's expert non-fiction editors. Visit www.curtisbrowncreative.co.uk to find out more about all the courses on offer. If you're ready to learn new writing skills with an online course, there is an exclusive discount for Always Take Notes listeners. Use the code ATN20 for £20 off the full price of writing your memoir or any other four, five or six week online course. Visit www.curtisbrowncreative.co.uk to find out more. Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, Rachel and myself spoke with the nature writer and novelist Helen MacDonald. We spoke to Helen about her huge success with the H's for Hawk, about writing about the natural world in poetry, journalism and non-fiction, and about Profit, her new novel co-written with Sin Blaché. It's a great episode and we hope you enjoy it. Welcome, Helen, to Always Take Notes. It's fantastic to have you on the show. Could we start with your new novel, Profit? It's a, a bit of a departure of genre, I, I assume, from what, what people would know you as writing. So could you tell us a little bit about how that project came about and why you wanted to, to work in sci-fi? It's it's a hysterical story. Um, so, so I've always loved sci-fi. It's been a kind of... Uh, something that I've read since I was a kid. Uh, I used to go out to charity shops and come home with hauls of kind of amazing magazine and Isaac Asimov and stuff. And so it's, it's always been there. It's just not what I was writing. And um, during lockdown, I had planned to go out to a remote atoll in the Pacific to write a book about Midway, this extraordinary ex-naval base full of albatrosses. But I couldn't go. Um, I was stuck at home drumming my fingers and I started chatting with a, an internet friend called Sin. Um, and Sin Blaché is a very cool person who lives in Ireland and um, has never really written any books, but has always written all, all their lives. Um, lots of kind of horror and, 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 and sort of sci-fi stuff. And uh, we were talking a lot just on Twitter about, you know, where we are now and what we like to watch, and what we saw. And, and she was playing a computer game called Control, which is a really cool computer game about um, a secret government agency full of secret sort of objects full of, of unearthly power. And we sort of talked about that and about nostalgia. And, and the more we talked, the more we thought, you know, we really want to tackle this, this sort of notion of what nostalgia is in our culture and what it, you know, the sort of dark political sort of um, aspects of it. But most of all, we wanted to write something fun. We sort of decided to start writing this sort of what I thought was going to be a novella which ended up being this huge sci-fi book. And um, it was so much fun to write. We wrote most of it um, genuinely through direct messages on Twitter. We'd send each other bit scraps and character ideas backwards and forwards and then whole chapters. And it was really fun because, you know, there I was writing with this person who I'd never met. And um, they'd write back and sort of say, oh, I don't think this is this bit's so good, you know. And I, some little part of me that's was sort of saying, I can't believe I'm being told what to write. I'm an award-winning writer. I mean, how obnoxious is that? And I started laughing at this terrible sense. So basically, um, they're a genius, an absolute genius, uh, particularly at characterization and dialogue. And we just wrote this huge book. It was a surprise. Um, I'm not really sure what the nature writing crowd are going to think of it. Um, it's very subversive. There's lots of swearing. <laughs> and it's really fun. So we're both really, really proud of it. 
Um, and it's just a, a sort of joyful thing that, you know, I didn't even get to meet my co-author until the book was nearly finished. And luckily we got on like a house on fire. So that's the story of Profit. Just expanding a bit on what you're saying, I mean, how did this process of, of writing jointly work? I mean, did you, who was sort of pulling together the, the master document and things like that? Um, I mean, how, yeah, really, we love to lift the lid on this kind of thing. Yeah. So it started off, uh, as I said, with just Twitter conversations, uh, private messages, and then we started kind of writing bits and pieces and keeping separate files on Scrivener, which both of us use. It's, you know, the most phenomenal piece of writing software. We quickly realized as the, the manuscript as was got longer that we needed a joint document. So we created a file in Google Docs and shared it. And it was always kind of fun to watch each other edit it in real time, sort of staring there. So I can't believe they're changing that bit there. But it, it's, it requires, I've talked a lot about this with Sin, it requires a lot of vulnerability to write like this and a lot of sort of bravery. But there's a sort of sense that once once we kind of nailed down chapters and we were really happy with them, there's a kind of strength to the the co-writing product. That's a, it's really astonishing to me now, looking back at it, that we really don't know who wrote which parts of the book now. It's become a sort of seamless enterprise. Although, you know, it was quite fun. A lot of the American characters I had problems with because, you know, I'd sort of give them lines out of Jane Austen and Sin would laugh at me and say, no, Helen, that's, that's not what Americans sound like. But... um Watching the thing come together quite organically was astonishing. So I think a lot of the plotting, the the main beats of the story were there from the beginning. We worked on that sort of quite early on. But a lot of it came organically as we as we wrote. And a lot of that was actually spurred from Sin writing conversations between the main characters. Um, just working from their characters, and then and then we sort of build scenes around those conversations, which was a way of working I've never done before. You know, being a nature writer, I just sort of tend to go out and wander around and look at things, and then come back and write about them. So it was, um, I think, it, I mean, life changing. I think um, a kind of writing I I honestly never thought I'd write horror. I never thought I'd write sci fi. I never thought I'd write romance or thriller. And this book is kind of all of the genres mashed together. And the genre thing is really important, I think, because um, there's a lovely line from a, I think it was an Instagram post from the novelist Sarah Pe- Perry. And she said that she really loves the um, the beauty, the nobility and the veracity of tropes. And I thought that was such an astonishing um, sentiment, you know, that, that, that we all sort of are bathed in these things. And we wanted to take these tropes and sort of play with them and make something a little bit subversive out of them. So, yeah, it was a joy, the whole thing. I find your description of watching someone else edit your work in Google Docs fun, amusing, because it's my idea of hell. Um, <laughs> but in terms of your writing process, I read that you are um, quite eager to edit. I mean, I, you described writing H for Hawk, which we'll get onto later, and you said you edited constantly as you were writing then. Was it a similar sort of thing here? That's a really good question. I think initially, um, a lot of my writing prose the sort of methodology, I guess, came from writing poetry. I started off as a poet and I always feel when writing a poem, it's a bit like sort of putting a watch together. There comes a point where you tinker and tinker and tinker and suddenly it starts working and snaps shut and you can't really do anything more to it. Um, And that's a really sort of brilliant moment when you're writing a poem. You think, oh, it doesn't want me anymore. I can let it go. It's, It's a live thing. And prose was like that for me. So with H's for Hawk, I really did start from the beginning and then just write and write and write. And I wouldn't leave a paragraph alone until I felt that it sort of snapped shut. And then I'd put the next link on with the next paragraph. And and one of the things I had to do with that book is I had to read it from the beginning every time I sat down to write until the bit where I'd stopped the day before, which meant that towards the end of writing that book, it took quite a long time to get down to work. But there was a sort of sense that the book had a had an arc, had a shape, that I needed to have in my mind before I could continue with the next, the next, uh, the next section. So it was, and it wasn't like that. Um, in that there was another mind at play, and I think trying to navigate that. There were a few things that I, you know, we'd, we'd write bits of the book that were for sort of later on in the book, and, and then piece them together. And that's something I've never done before, and that was quite scary for me. It's like, why am I writing chapter sixty? Like, how how does that? work. But um, it turns out that there's more than one way to skin a cat, as the saying goes. Um, and I'm really happy with with discovering a new way to write. 
Can I ask what was the reaction of your your sort of professional people, so your agent, your publishers, stuff like that, when Helen MacDonald, acclaimed nature writer, uh, announced that she had written a, a sci-fi story? Yeah, I'm kind of grinning here. Yeah, there was some 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 consternation. Uh, so my agent is the astonishing um, Bill Clegg. Uh, he's based in New York, and uh, you know he he was surprised and uh, I think a little cautious um, and. Uh, I sent him some work, you know, some of the pages. And then suddenly he was like, oh, no, let's, you know, I think you should continue writing this. And he was really helpful, actually. We we had, there was this, one of my f- favourite moments in the entire construction of this book was this one Zoom that I did with Sin. And Sin hadn't really met Bill before. And, you know, they were very nervous. And I was very nervous about, you know, we sent him a whole load of pages with these ridiculous characters that, you know, doing ridiculous things. Um, one of the characters is a, um, an American sort of field agent for the defense intelligence agency. You know, he's kind of scary, kind of Jason Bourne type. Um, and, uh, we sent all these pages and had a zoom and, and we were waiting for all this terrible, you know, feedback. We thought, you know, maybe he's going to say, you have to junk this, this isn't going to work. You know, maybe you need to sort of completely rethink the story. And he said, well, you know, I just think you need to make Adam hotter and more dangerous. And we were like, OK, we can we can do that. So it was it was um, it was a ride. The whole thing was 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 surprisingly smooth in terms of it being accepted as a, a sort of new, a new, uh, a new genre for me. But, yeah, I do think that um, it's not my usual audience. Um, so I'm kind of interested in, in, in meeting a whole new kind of um constituency of readers you know a lot of my readers tend to be you know in this country anyway tend to be sort of quite well off white kind of middle class people and one of the things I love about sci-fi is it's so increasingly so it's such an inclusive genre um and much younger as well so not that I don't love my nature writing readers but I'm, I'm really excited to read to reach different audiences and in terms of sort of further logistics, did Sin have an agent or was the book sort of all handled through through yours? And how did it work with the advance? Was it split completely equally? Yeah, right from the beginning, the, the book is genuinely 50-50. Um, it's not a sense of sort of, as you, you know, just trying to describe, it's not like nothing was ghostwritten or it wasn't me putting down Sin's ideas or vice versa. So um, from very early on, we, we said to, to Bill, you know, this needs to be 50-50 split. Um, you know, absolutely down the line. And so that's what we did. And and Bill represents Sin in this book. And um, yeah, no, it's it's worked pretty well. Um, and it's it's just kind of, I don't know, I'm still surprised that this, this book that was a kind of lockdown um, refuge from the misery and despair of, of the pandemic has, has become a real life thing. It's, it's, it's sort of, you know, keep pinching myself. Could we roll back now from the new project to your early life and particularly, um, you know, where your interest in, in birds and sort of matters natural came from? I love this this line that you talked about growing up in Surrey. It was made of pine forests, golf courses, elderly army officers with parade ground voices, conservative clubs and tea dancers. Tell us a bit about your, you know, where you came from. And then um, there's another thing that we found that you uh, would literally cling to the wire at a, a local aviary. Is that right? Oh yes. Oh, I remember that. It was a, a, a an a, uh, it was a garden centre on the A30, and I was so desperately obsessed with birds. They were kind of my special interests. I would sort of eat, sleep, and think about them all the time. Well, as, well as I did eat birds, I suppose that's kind of true, I guess. But um, yeah, so I'd, I'd badger my parents to take me to this garden centre again, and they had this tiny aviary with you know a few kind of drab zebra finches in it and maybe like a quail on the bottom wandering around and I just I just stand there transfixed watching these birds they they were so mesmerizingly different um so other and I was the, I was the kid that was obsessed with dinosaurs so I guess it's the kind of it's a sort of natural you know kind of way to a, attach that love of dinosaurs to something that's alive now and and you know I really did walk around from very early age with a pair of binoculars around my neck. I had this pair of quite heavy but small East German binoculars and they were just me. I, I didn't go anywhere without them. Even I even go to London with them on, you know, they were kind of like my sort of, you know, some kids have teddy bears I had in my pair of binoculars. So I was quite a quirky child. Um, but that early love of birds and nature um, was very much, I think, 
spurred by the conditions in which I was raised. So um, I've written a bit about this in, in the collection Vespa Flights. My parents are both hard-bitten journalists. My dad was a photojournalist. And they bought this house in a a strange kind of old school country estate slap bang in the middle of Camberley in Surrey. And it was sort of faded sort of formal parkland and a meadow and sort of all looking kind of a little bit sad. And it was owned by the Theosophical Society, which is, you know, a sort of 19th century eco, eco esoteric organisation. And it was full of these wonderfully eccentric old ladies and you know, and people. And, and basically, I just what I ran wild in this environment. It was like a real 19th century children's book. And I got into trouble for sort of going to the pond and catching newts. And I'd bring snakes home, much to the consternation of my parents and spend a lot of time in this meadow. Um, and I think one of the things that's very important for a writer is a sort of sense of scale and a sense of an ability to, to, to decenter the your own place in the world. So, you know, a lot of the Stories I love most in, in fiction are those in which people or the main characters think that they are the the main character of the story. And then later on, they discover that actually they're just a bit player in someone else's story. And that was the experience I had. And it was joyful. So I'd sort of lie in the grass and stare into the bottom of the grass stems and see tiny insects the size of punctuation marks wandering around. Or I'd, and then I look up at the sky and see these you know giant clouds the size of mountains sort of passing over. And um, for a child whose environment was sort of schoolrooms and and the rooms in houses, it was a real eye opener to the the much larger and smaller workings of the world. That was a really important thing for me. As well as binoculars, you also carried around notebooks, and you've spoken about writing dreadful poetry and and stories when you were young. Was was that writing mostly nature fake, focused at that time as well? No, I mean yes and no. I was thinking about that the other day actually because. Um, I I had this sort of trove of, looking back on it, really quite dubious books of stories for children. It was kind of, you know, like sort of 1932 Daily Mail stories for kids. And I, I became obsessed with the Willard Price books of, you know, the Willard Price adventure books, which, you know, two posh American boys going around the world catching animals for zoos. I loved those books. I, lo- I, I, I read those. I'm so glad, Simon, because they were amazing. And a lot of my early natural historical knowledge came directly from those books. And I was the kind of kid that would just come out with facts about, you know, giant clans. One has the impression they weren't possibly helping the natural world by sort of scooping everything up in their nets. They, they certainly weren't, but, but they definitely a, a, a appealed to the acquisitive small person that I was. And yeah, I so I used to do this thing at school and I still feel guilty about it. We used to have to write stories at school. And I used to just basically rewrite everything that I read, you know. I mean, I think I got into trouble once when I sort of started to write a story that was about a hobbit. <laughs> you know, like, the teacher was like, oh, hang on a minute, you know. Um, but I just assumed that none of the teachers would have read all the books that I'd read, which is really quite obnoxious, actually. But um, I used to just, yeah, sort of rewrite these stories. Um, and there was a lot of stuff about, you know, being on a yacht in the South Pacific, you know, catching tropical fish and... Yeah, so there's a kind of, I always feel there's a bit of fraudulence to my early writing. It was all a bit uh, mimetic rather than creative. Because at that time, I wanted to be an artist. You know, that's that's all I wanted to be. I you know, was obsessed with painting and drawing. And that, that sort of desire to be an artist sort of continued right the way through until university, really. And, and I think it's really affected my writing, the, that sort of visual sense. So, you know, when I look at a landscape now, I'm... I'm instantly trying to sort of block in colour values and work out how you would approach it as a as a picture or a painting. And I think that's very much how I think about writing about sort of scenery and atmosphere is, you know, the visual is very important to me. So, so you then did English at university and you then did postgraduate study. Were you thinking at that time that you wanted to be a academic or was there a different set of reasoning? Simon, again, I think I'm, I'm seeing like a canary today. Genuinely, my route through life has been um, a desperate attempt to not be bored. You know, I, I did an English degree at Cambridge. Um, I really liked that. But there was another half of me that was birds and science and nature. So after I did that, I disappeared off to um, work for a conservation organization in the, in, in the Gulf states, you know, working on trying to protect the falcons used in Arab falconry. So that was, a you know, not the sort of thing that you normally do after an English degree. But then I got kind of bored with that because I wasn't thinking. So then I came back to do an MPhil in the history of science. And I really thought at that point that I found my metier because, you know, I 
was really fascinated when I was a undergraduate about, you know, discovering critical takes on books, you know, how to read a book and see in a book, there's always much more than the author intended. You know, you get this window onto the social mores of the time and the kinds of things that are going on there. And I realized that I could, in the history of science, look at, say, the history of natural history or the history of biology and sort of see the same social things going on underpinning the science. Um, so that was really fascinating. And I think that really informed a lot of the way I look at the natural world. Um, but the, as I went through that process, you know, I started a PhD, but I, I didn't finish it because I, I got really fed up with knowing that all these amazing theories and facts and phenomena that I was encountering in that world were always going to stay inside the academy. And I just thought, I want to write for everyone. It really was that simple. And you know, I remember speaking to my mum about it and she was like, you know, but it's not a steady job. And I'm like, yeah, but it's what I really want to do. So I took the plunge. Yeah. And it's worked out okay so far. Where did your uh, first collection of poetry um, published in 2001 fit into this in, t- in terms of the timeline? Yeah. I So when I was at uh, university, I hung out with a whole bunch of sort of reprobate Cambridge poets. Um, and back in that day, they really were kind of, you know, it was all red wine and Baudelaire. I think it's still like that now. It's still like that now. Yeah. I remember going... I mean, I, I, I can't speak to it, but when I was at university, it was still a lot like that. <laughs> I remember going to dinner once with a, a family and the, the lady of the house was complaining about poets and she's like don't ever invite them around Helen they're a nightmare they're getting drunk and smash your furniture and they just talk about themselves all the time I was like, okay Kate but I really was interested in, in this Cambridge poetry which is this really linguistically sort of challenging kind of thorny difficult poetry from Jer- Jeremy Prynne you know and and I I thought it was fascinating in the way that a say a cryptic crossword is fascinating and people often talk about it as if it's this sort of you know very obscure, quite off-putting kind of elite type of poetry. But I always found it to be more like a crossword puzzle, like what's going on here. You're like, like the watch metaphor. I wanted to sort of pull it apart and see what was doing. And I, so I, I ended up writing a lot of poetry when I was at university, partly because I was interested in taking the kind of grand um, cadences of lyric poetry and then sort of stuffing it full of technical vocabulary and stuff that it sh- that shouldn't be there. It was really fun to do. And partly because I was an incredibly miserable bastard when I was at university and, and poetry was a very good way to, you know, mope. So I did, <laughs> I did that as well. And the, that book came out, the collected poems came out after, I, ha- I mean, I hadn't written much poetry for, for a long while. That was just sort of collected stuff. There was some interest in it. And I was really pleased to see it out. It's very strange to read it now. You know, I feel that I'm in contact with a, a sort of past self that doesn't really know what they want to say yet, you know, but is having a lot of fun with words. We are thrilled to announce the publication of Always Take Notes, advice from some of the world's greatest writers. The book, edited by the two of us, features contributions from almost 100 past guests on the podcast. It's a distillation of the wit and wisdom we've heard over the past six years. The book offers, we think, frank and entertaining guidance on writing in particular and living a creative life in general. It answers questions such as, where do the best ideas come from? How do you stay motivated? What does it take to become a published author? And how do you actually make money from your writing? Published by Ithaca Press, Always Take Notes, advice from some of the world's greatest writers, is available from October 12th in all good bookshops. We hope you enjoy reading it. And how did uh, Falcon um, come about, your, your book in 2006? We're, we're always interested in the show in the kind of mechanics of, of agents and book deals and, and stuff like that. So how, how did that get off the ground? I didn't have an agent at that time, so this is a cautionary tale. I was approached by the series editor um, at a, a table in the university library tea room. So this is one of those stories, of course, of, of sort of privilege and being in the right place at the right time. And, you know, as you know, a, a, you know, a lot of it works like that, you know. And I again, I think of my co-writer, you know, Sin. Um, you know, Sin is a genius writer, um, but has never been in a situation where she's been in contact with the people that would open doors for her. So, you know, I was very lucky um, being at university to, to know people who, you know, edited book series. And he said, like, let's let's write a book. And I said yes. And then, you know, I got my advance of £300 or whatever it was, or I think it was £350. Um, 
which was like later discovered, you know, probably would need an agent <laughs> and wrote the book. It was really fun. I wrote a lot of it on a holiday with my mum and dad in, in uh, we went to, where did we go into Italy? Lake Garda. And I had, I, I'm like a bit of a vampire with Scottish blood. So I, they all went out in the sun and I kind of sat in my hotel room and typed on my ancient uh, laptop. And that was really fun. That was a lot of the stuff from my academic work that was too fun really to go into academia. It was a lot of stories and anecdotes um, but reading that now, it's a really strange book. It's like, it's, it's trying to be a popular book, but I'm still kind of caged in with, I think a lot of a desire to be clever, right? I, I'm using a lot of academic jargon. I'm kind of trying. It's, I think the, the I'm pleased with the book, but it doesn't seem to, there was a lesson I learned when I, when I wrote Ages for Hawk, and that was to be as authentic and as honest as possible and as grounded in, in, in oneself as possible. And I hadn't got anywhere near that when I wrote Falcon. So it's fun, but it's it's not really me. That was my next question about academic versus non-academic writing. So we can go straight past that. Um, and then what did you do in that, in that period between um, Falcon and Ages for Hawks? It's a sort of seven year period in the- of it. Yeah. Sorry, I've, I've, this is so weird to think back on it all. And I, um, I, I got a research fellowship at Jesus College in Cambridge, and that was amazing. And then my father died suddenly, which was not amazing. And I, I really fell off the world. Um, you know, we were really dear friends. He was a really great, great guy. Um, and very, very similar as well. I think one of the things that, you know, deaths always do is sort of remind one that people that share um, a view of the world with you are very far, few and far between. Um, so there was the enormous grief of his passing and also the loneliness of his passing and also the sort of loneliness of feeling that, that, that sort of that eye and that brain that, that also encountered the world like mine had also gone. And it was, it was just awful. It was very sudden and unexpected. And, um, I really was a hopeless research fellow after that. I, as you might know, if you've, if you've read H's for Hawk, I went off and got a goshawk. <laughs> Because, you know, I rather dumbly thought that the way of dealing with grief was to train a hawk. This is not a good idea. Um, I don't recommend it. But it was a very intense um, situation. I, you know, I, I, I got this this goshawk, which is um, Britain's, I guess, wildest and most sort of ferocious bird of prey and most difficult to tame. And I sequestered myself away like a monk in my college house. And I, I, I sort of lived with Mabel and we went out... Um, and I watched her fly and hunt in the Cambridgeshire hunt, uh, countryside. And it was a very feral existence. And I kind of fell off the world even more, really. You know, people sort of say, oh, is it, did, did the hawk make things better? And I'm like, well, no, you know, it's not like I was sad. And then I got a cat and then I felt better. It was very much, you know, I went into the sort of underworld with this, this hawk. And, and by the end of that period, I sort of got into this state where I was sort of barely human. I really identify with this bird more than I did my friends and family and really cut myself off from the world and and then came out of that with the help of friends and antidepressants and the passage of time and it's it's I don't know it's um it was a even at the time even while this was all happening I knew that there was a story to this that was bigger than me and older than me and I thought one day I'd like to write this and it, it took seven years to have enough distance to be able to do that. I needed to make myself into a character that I could write about, just as I wrote about the other character in the book, T.H. White. Um, and that was a very peculiar experience of sort of dealing with this character in, that was me. And, you know, quite often I'd be sort of typing and swearing under my breath, you know, you idiot, what were you thinking? <laughs> but yeah, so it took seven years of, of you know, I was sort of part-time jobs and penniless and surviving on lentils and rice and counting up tuppences down the back of the sofa. But um, the book came out of it, yeah. One thing I heard elsewhere was that the, the THY element, the shadow biography, came in at a, when the project was at a, at a relatively advanced stage. Is that right? Because it's quite, it's quite a structurally nuanced book, right? The moving between it. Could you tell us, like, in terms of how, you know, when, when White came into the picture, then how you worked out this, this pretty sophisticated way of moving between your narrative and, and his narrative? Thank you for the sophistication comment. It felt like blundering at the time. I, um, so yeah, I, he was always going to be in the book because um, I'd read his attempt to train a goshawk in the 1930s, you know, this book, The Goshawk, many years ago, and it always upset me because he, you know, 
basically, again, if you haven't read the book, he was a man who wasn't given any of the tools to know how to love anything, including himself. And he saw himself in this bird and kind of wanted to punish it, but wanted to love it and wanted it to love him. And it was just the most psych awful psychodrama that ends up with the hawk escaping kind of on purpose um, and flying away probably for you know to its doom. Um, but the he was going to be in it, but then I thought, well, look, I better go over and see if I can look at his um, archives, which are in the Harry Ransom Center in Austin, Texas. So there I was, this sort of, um, you know, I, I again, I had very little money at that point, so I, I booked a room in a really dubious motel under a sort of underpass. I remember there was a very bad moment when I looked out the window one morning and walked down and and there was a cat sort of, you know, licking up vomit in the car park. And I thought, you know, this is not the writing life I expected. So every morning I'd go to the Harry Ransom Center and sit there and go through these extraordinary diaries. And I was very lucky in that T.H. White not only had very clear handwriting, but was an extraordinary, extraordinarily um, open diarist. So he would he would put things in his diaries that, you know, I, I didn't expect. And he's a very, very problematic character in many, many ways. Um but I found out a lot of stuff there and I thought this, lots more has, of him has to be in the book. He really did haunt me. But, and the structuring was kind of easy in a way because, you know, the, the sort of stations of the cross, as it were, the kind of the different, um, you know, moments in the, in the taming of a hawk and the, winning the trust of the hawk and then getting the hawk to fly to you and then fly free. You know, that progression was, was sort of matched by his. So, there was a kind of conversation between me and this and and this this sort of dead author and his and his sad bird but i didn't want it to be a book about how you know i can train a hawk and he couldn't um it was much more about um both of us fell into the trap i think of of identifying far too much with a bird we projected all of our own brokenness into and i think that was what really made the book was that sense of shared sadness between me and this very different character. I was interested when, and you've spoken and, and written about this, that, you know, White used um, his relationship with with the bird as a sort of metaphor for writing about his own sexuality and, and self-acceptance and that sort of thing. So given you'd read that book when you were young, was that a model, you know, in terms of using writing about an animal to write about yourself, was that a model that you were conscious of of working within or emulating? I didn't understand that when I read it when I was small I just thought he was a monster um I had all of the kind of entitlement of of of, of being a child and I'm like you know he got it wrong I think I even have a copy of the book where I, I would like write complaints in the margin about what he should have been doing in my sort of school girl <laughs> writing um it was much later and I think post English degree that I realized that a lot of the there was a whole kind of genre of animal books that I'd either read or I'd heard about that was set in the 20s and 30s up to the sort of 50s that became increasingly apparent to me were fables about being an outsider, quite often about being gay. So, you know, um, they were, the Ring of Bright Water is a classic example. You know, you have Gavin Maxwell, this very sort of sad, quite bitter gay man living in a, a hovel in, 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 in Scotland with these otters. And there's a kind of sort of way of writing about tenderness and about love uh, that isn't the acceptable, normal sort of straight human love, you know, that most books are about, that seems to me very, very queer in these books now. But I didn't, you know, again, that was something that I sort of had worked out by the time I started writing Ages of a Hawk. Um, but it is a really fascinating phenomenon. And, and you know, there aren't really as many books like that now. And I, I like to think that's because people are a lot less in need of them. Again, on the kind of mechanics, at what stage in this this journey did you get the book contract and and how did that come about uh, and then at what stage was it clear that this was this was going to be a really big hit as well I spent a long time writing the biggest proposal in the world I look back on it now and I'm like god Helen well, you know what was that all about it was like you know 20,000 <laughs> words I became a, um, I had a, an agent at that point um, Jessica Woolard who did a phenomenal job um, selling that book and um, yeah, so it was a, it was the first two chapters, um, an extraordinary long synopsis, which, you know, sort of baffles me now. Um, and then I, you know, put stuff in like, you know, who am I in a CV? And, you know, it was like I was applying to be president or something, but, but it worked. And, and I had this really bizarre experience, you know, that 
um, Jessica took it around to various editors and, and, um, you know, I, I did this day in London, which became legendary. And, um, I went to visit all these publishers who, you know, were interested in, in, in publishing it. And of course, you know, I, I was terrified. I thought I was being interviewed. So I was like really nervous. I hadn't realized that they were trying to impress me. <laughs> so I was sort of shaking at these meetings. And they were all wonderful. You know, all of the publishers were, you know, there were sort of free books and there was coffee and there were sort of chocolates. And I was like, this is amazing. You know, I began to sort of think, you know, I'm going to go with the one who gives me the most chocolates, you know, or something like that. I was in this kind of bizarre sort of dream world. And then I ended up uh, on um, Vauxhall Bridge Road and went to have a meeting with Jonathan Cape. And, you know, I knew already that Jonathan Cape was a huge deal. And if I went there, I'd probably be a very small fish in a big pond. But, you know, why not try it? And the managing guy there, the, the, the publishing director, um, Dan Franklin, who's now retired, but is just one of the loveliest men in the world and a complete legend, came down to the foyer to meet me, which none of the other people had done, and went upstairs into what felt at that time like a really big messy newsroom from the 80s and I grew up in newsrooms so it was instantly familiar it felt like home and he said Do you want a cup of tea and he went off himself and made me a cup of tea um and I thought well that's lovely and then we then there were just the, the, the sort of questioning that I got from the team there was on another level you know they really got the book and they really really wanted to tussle with some of the things in it and I just thought I really want to go with these people and that's how it went um and then I had to write the bloody thing, which was another, another thing. And that took a year and a half. And there's lots of swearing and hiding under the desk and, um, you know, the usual writing stuff. Was it hard to sort of replumb the depths of your griefs in, t- in the writing process? And given a bit of time had elapsed, had you kept journals or notes, you know, at the time when you had thought you might want to return to it later? Yeah, I... I and the relationship between the notes and the actual writing is is surprising to me. So after dad died, I started keeping a diary again in a way I hadn't done since I was a teenager. I think I was trying to sort of stitch the world back together with my writing. And um, and then I had a hawk. So the hawk was in it. Um, and then I had a separate diary, which was the kind of the hawk's diary of taming and, you know, events in the in the hawk sort of. Um, I don't like the word training. It sounds sort of wrong. It's it's really getting the hawk used to you enough to, to be with you when it's doing its normal thing. But something happened after grief. And I think, you know, talking to many people since that time, you know, it seems to be people after a very big grief, they tend to either forget everything or they remember everything with terrible clarity. And I was one of the latter. And, and you know, I didn't even refer, I referred to the diary quite a lot for, for times and days and weather and stuff like that. But um, I didn't really need to, you know, I, ha- I have the most astonishing recall even now of what it was like to be out with Mabel in the rain, you know, watching raindrops run down her feathery nape and the patterns of the leaves beneath my feet. Um, so it was, it was very surprising how, how clear those memories were. And I have a terrible memory, you know, so I remember at one point thinking, well, I ne- can never write another book about anything because I'm never going to be able to remember it like I do this. So, But but going back and being that person who was full of grief was easy when it was writing about the hawk and about the natural world. And it was very, very hard writing about things like, for example, going to see my father as he lay in hospital. You know, um, those were... I had to just rewrite and rewrite and rewrite those. And in fact, the, I think I... I may have said elsewhere, but the book had lots of false starts. Um, initially, I really thought people would be less interested in me than the bird, um, which I'm sure they probably are, but it was a lot more British. I didn't really want to kind of, you know, tell everyone what I was feeling. I just wanted to say, look, this amazing hawk happened. Look at this thing. And I kept trying to write it and it kept running up against a brick wall. And then I remember this day that... I realized that the only way to do this book was to be devastatingly honest about everything. And I'd never done that before, but it was just a moment I started writing and then it just started to flow. And I think readers know when you're not being honest and authentic. And those words are so sort of, they're so overused, but you know it when you've hit that, the bedrock of, 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 of truth when you write. And that was astonishing. Yeah. The book really began to sing as soon as I thought, right, fuck it. I swore, sorry. 
<laughs> Swearing is absolutely fine. <laughs> That's good. I wanted to say as well to, to listeners that Dan Franklin is a past guest on Always Take Notes, so you can uh, you can hear an interview with him. Uh, and just on that, following on that that um, point I raised earlier, when was it? When did you know that this was the book was was going to do very well? I mean, was there a particular moment, or was it a kind of slow burn? How did that piece work? I I was so numb throughout that whole spectacular sudden, you know, event. Um, I knew, I was excited because Waterston's picked it as a book of the month. I was like, oh, that's good. Um, I was delighted in some of the reviews were in sort of big papers, you know, that was nice. And then suddenly it was, it was in the bestseller list. And, and, you know, I, I, that whole sort of first year, I didn't even, I don't think I even let myself kind of enjoy it. I was just so stunned that this book was being read by so many people. It just seemed so beyond, you know, I, I didn't even, I, it's funny, you know, some people have told me that they write because they want lots of readers or they write because, you know, they want people to sort of know about them or their stories or whatever. And, and absolutely that's a really good way to write. But I just read, I re- honestly wrote this story because I wanted to write it and, I did worry quite a lot that it wouldn't sell. In fact, when when I'd finished the manuscript, it took me a few days to pluck up enough courage to send it in because I'm like, you know, this is a really weird book. You know, it's kind of all sorts of genres mixed together and it's not that happy. You know, what have I done? Poor Dan, you know, Cape are going to be furious. And then it just it just went went crazy. And, it, and in America, too, you know, I I still. No, it's still it's still an extraordinary event that that happened. Um, I'm delighted, obviously, but but. Um, Meeting readers on tour, I think, gave me a real idea of what might have been driving that. And it was just the number of people that came up to me after talks and and told me sort of griefs and darknesses and losses that they'd experienced of a magnitude, you know, much greater than mine. And um, I realised, you know, it it is the case that we don't really talk about grief very much. Um, It's still a bit of a taboo subject. And the book really chimed with a lot of people who saw their experiences reflected in his pages, even though it was about a hawk. And also young mums. Did I, did I, if I told you this, I had loads of young mums and young dads come up and tell me that the book was about having a baby. And I'm like, what? <laughs> they said, you know, you're trapped in a room with a creature that doesn't talk and you don't know what it wants. And, you know, um, you want it, you love it and want to do your best by it, but you're really scared and isolated. And I'm like, oh yeah, no, that does sound like training a hawk. So that was really fun. And the book went on to win prizes and, as you say, become this phenomenon. Um, how did that change things for you, both financially and in terms of your sense of yourself as a writer? Um, the book winning prizes was a delight um, because by that time, I really began to think of the book as something that had a life of its own. Um, I know, and I still think of a book like this. A book is like... Um, like may, maybe making a pot if you're a potter, you know, you spend, you've, you've spent years sort of training making pots and you make a pot and you're really pleased with it and you fire it and well, you glaze it and fire it. And then, you know, you put it on a shelf and then it goes off and does something by itself. It's its own thing. And I felt with the awards that the book was getting the awards, not me. And um, so I was really proud of it. I was really proud of the book. And uh, I think the one that, that, made me the most surprised it, it won a big um, prize in France so I went off to this really fancy pants thing in Paris and it and it and it won a prize in Paris and um that was amazing I discovered you know Parisian literary c- culture is very different from here there was some kind of a ceremony at 10 a.m the next morning for sort of publishers and everyone was sort of drinking champagne and you know troughing down foie gras and I'm like oh this is amazing you know this is not like London so yeah it was it's it's it was, it was, I, 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 yeah, still speechless at, at, at the life the book's had since then. I saw in another interview as well that your your cottage is, was sort of built on the success of that as well. You were able to to buy this place in Suffolk as well. Yes, this house that I'm in now, I've, I've had to, um, I've got these two parrots and it's been a bit of a nightmare. They went through a very hormonal phase a few months ago and they've discovered that they can go behind the books on my bookcases and then they chew all along the 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 books. And so all of my books are destroyed now. It's a sort of, you know, hubris thing. Um, yeah, so initially in terms of financial stuff, I was really poor and then the book did okay and then it did well. And suddenly I was driving a car that didn't break down every 10 miles. So I think that was a real, really nice moment. And um yeah, I bought a house and, you know, I never thought that would be possible. 
um, I thought I was going to rent forever. Um, so it has led to some sense of security and, and that, that I, I never possessed before. That's been really lovely. And I feel really lucky with that one. In terms of following up on a hit like that, did you find it hard to put pen to paper or indeed start typing again? Or was the itch to write so sort of strong that it didn't didn't affect you too much? Yeah, I've never understood that. You know, I, again, I I really do hold that there are millions of different kinds of writers and I, I really admire those who, you know, can't stop writing. I find it very easy to stop writing. <laughs> so... But at the t- but what was happening, you know, during the kind of tours of HS for Hawk, I had this amazingly wonderful gig with a great editor called Sasha Weiss at the New York Times magazine. And I did a, a, a series of um, columns about nature and I, I did features for them. And then they commissioned me to do things I would never have done on my own. You know, I went off to Chile with some space scientists to who went off to the Atacama Desert to study you know, areas that are kind of Mars analogs for the next Mars mission. And, you know, there I was kind of, you know, minus 30 swearing in my, in my, you know, sleeping bag. Um, So all of these things I did and I started writing about uh, for the New York Times. And then I discovered I really loved that essay form. I love the sense that uh, an essay to me, you know, there's always a reader right by my shoulder. They, they tend to be puzzles that I'm trying to find something out and um, the reader comes along with me. So I really loved writing them all. And some are written for what I decided would be a book of essays. Um, and that was the, the advantage of that was that it wouldn't be something that would be compared to Asia's for Hawk. I couldn't write another book just like that, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, so this book, Vesper Flights, came out of, of, of all those pieces and thoughts I was having and experiences I had and um put it together and and uh uh yeah it's uh, I'm, I'm quite fond of it as a as a as a book it's very people talk about it being full of hope which is something we you know we really need to cling on cling on to at this time of the sixth rate extinction um and i'm glad people like it for that could you tell us about this midway project both how it came about and then how it got um sort of interrupted i saw on twitter that you you got this alarming sounding illness thyrotoxicosis on um, but maybe you could start it by telling our geographically challenged listeners where Midway is, and then perhaps we could take it from there. Mid- Midway is astonishing. So it's a tiny, uh, it's two two tiny, tiny islands um, right in the middle of the Pacific. It's like 1,500 miles northwest of Hawaii. It's possibly one of the remote, pla- most remote places on Earth. And it doesn't have a history of dispossession like many islands, um, but it was kind of a staging post on the extremely posh, a uh, flying boat route from San Francisco to uh, Shanghai. Um, and then it became a naval, you know, station during the Second World War, as people probably know, the Battle of Midway, which took place quite close to it, when the Americans uh, broke the Japanese naval codes so as a sort of huge battle. But the I first came across Midway when I was a kid reading my dad's National Geographic magazines. And there was a an article from summer 1964 and it was called the Goonie Birds of Midway and it was like everything it was like it was like you know military planes and albatrosses and birds and you know um and it was about the these crews that flew um from Midway every day on these 24-hour flights because back then they they were they hadn't developed over the horizon radar so they needed to you know, they sort of built a ring of defense early warning line stations around the north of Alaska to detect Russian missiles coming in. Um, but there was a whole area of the North Pacific that was completely clear of any kind of warning um, radar. So they would just send these planes up for 24 hours a day just to patrol the horizons to make sure that there weren't any you know, incoming um, nukes. And they they took off from Midway. And there was a huge battle between you know, these albatrosses on Midway, which kept flying into the planes and, you know, whatever. And there were these photographs of this, you know, these lawns um, with military buildings behind them. And every three or four feet was an albatross sitting on eggs. And I was like, what is this? And the more I thought about it, the more I thought uh, it, it would be the most amazing book to write because the albatross is so already like a real symbol of kind of guilt. We've got like Coleridge's albatross and you've got kind of Baudelaire's albatross. And we're all kind of struggling with environmental guilt um, the albatrosses are being, you know, assailed by plastic pollution, by sea level changes, by weather changes. And I thought, I'm going to write a book about the end of the world. <laughs> so 
I went off to Midway and helped with the albatross count there. Every year, the Fish and Wildlife Service um, does a census, which involves, you know, walking up and down for six weeks, clicking counters and counting albatrosses. And then you go to sleep at night and you dream of albatrosses. Um, but it was the most extraordinary experience. You know, it's the place in Hawaiian tradition where souls are born and where souls go back to when they die. And as soon as I got off the plane, I'm like, oh, of course, you know, it's it's intensely kind of moving place. Um, so I did this and then suddenly I got really sick. I got really weak um, and I got this lump in my throat and I didn't know what was going on. Uh, I couldn't sleep. And um, and then the doctor called me over at lunch one time in the sort of canteen and said, will you come to my doctor's sort of facility on the island? And he took my resting heart rate. It was like 125 or something. And he looked at me and said, you have a goiter. <laughs> I'm like, isn't that a medieval disease? And he went, yeah, you've got thyroid toxicosis. You have to go home now. And I'm like, but, you know, I've only I've got another week. And he went, you have to go home now or you might die. And I'm like, oh, OK. So I came home in a in a hurry uh, with lots of unfinished business. So that was my exciting um, adventure on Midway. But it, it really is amazing. I can't wait to go back. I should go back this this um, winter, I hope, to do that again and not get sick this time and write the book. We're coming towards the end of our time. So a couple of last questions from me. Um, one is what your assessment of nature writing as a genre is today. You've described it in the past as a bit of a boy's own club. So, you know, are there any writers working within the genre today that you think are sort of evolving and doing interesting things within that space? And secondly, and sort of relatedly, you've said in the past your ultimate subject is love. And I wanted to hear a little bit more about, about why you think that. Nature writing is getting a lot better. It's such a hated uh, term, isn't it, nature writing? You know, you've got writers sort of, you know, oh, I'm not a nature writer. <laughs> like, um, it's got a bad, it has a bad rap. It has has had a, you know, um, it's been interrogated a lot, um, as you know, for being overly white, overly middle class, you know, overly the kind of writer that will point out a plant and basically say, aren't you lucky to have me to explain this to you? Um I love those writers, by the way, and that voice that they use is very easy to fall into when you write about nature. It's a bit like when you do sort of documentary filming, you, you end up sounding like David Attenborough. You can't help it. You know, that's what it is. But there's so many more voices now um, from, uh, you know, people of colour, black writers, trans writers, you know, um, it's queer writers. It's, it's like a really, really sort of booming um, set of writers now that are coming up that are really showing something which should be obvious to everyone and that is that nature doesn't belong to any one person or one type of person it belongs to all of us and the ways we approach approach it and think about it very hugely and we need all those voices more, more than ever now um so i mean the, the book that i generally go to when i want to get across like something that everyone should read um well there's robin, robin wall kimmerer's braiding sweetgrass which has had a you know had a huge success um, and then an amazing book called um, Home Place by J. Drew Lanham, which is about a book about um, land and birds by a black ornithologist from America. It's it's exquisite. So those are two really good. But that, you know, just go to the shelves. There's lots of really great books coming. What was the second question? Love, writing about love. Oh, yes, love. Yeah, I write about love. Like, wh why would you want to write about anything else? I mean, having said that, you know, the book about albatrosses is going to be about the end of the world and... Part of me is kind of like, you know, love and death are so closely, you know, um, entwined that maybe I write about death and love. I don't know. But I just think there's so much joy to be had in paying attention to the natural world and trying to understand the kind of very complicated systems that surround us, that are invisible to us, that why would, why would... I don't really want to write elegiacally about them or I don't really want to write about them in terms of sort of science. I want to write about them in terms of emotional connection, love and joy, because that's what spurs people, you know. And then this this science fiction novel is a giant queer love story. You know, the, the book is um, very much uh, about the dangers of nostalgia and about, you know, it's about the weaponization of nostalgia by a secret <laughs> government military project. But at heart, it's a giant love story. And, you know, I just think things are really, really rough. The world is full of very bad things right now. That sounds extremely kind of like trite, but it's grim out there. So uh, if you're going to tie yourself to anything, I think it, it should be love. 
And a, a final question for me is about your your future plans. You've mentioned the the albatross. Um, what else is is on your horizon when it comes to to writing and other things? Well, uh, Sid and I are hoping to write a TV series from Profit, which will be really fun. Um, and then at Midway, which is going to be, I, I cannot wait to get into that. And then I'd really love there to be more books in the sci-fi series with the same characters um, as a kind of, you know, I, I sort of see it now, my, my kind of writing career of sort of working in parallel, you know, there'll be the, the sort of big nature books and the nonfiction books. And then this really delightful um, other kind of book that, that, that is just a, a very different way of writing and a different um a different thing altogether. Um, I've al- I've always sort of felt that my life's always been divided into sort of two things. So it's always, you know, back in the day, it was nature and literature. Um, and then the two came together in Ages for Hawk. And now I think it's like, you know, sci-fi and, and nature. And I'm going to try and keep those things running in parallel, I think. Or you could bring them together as well. Constant, constant merging. Well, it's, it's, it's true. I mean, you know, a lot of the, the greatest eco, ecological kind of takes at the moment, um, are written as science fiction. You know, Jeff Vandermeer, you know, for example, um, see Pam Zheng, you know, those, those, those books are phenomenal works about the environment. Well, thank you so much for speaking to us today and wishing you all the very best of luck with all of your different projects going forward. Thank you. It's been a joy. Thank you very much. That was the Always Take Notes interview with Helen McDonald. She's on Twitter at Helen J. McDonald and Profit is published by Jonathan Cape. Hello, it's us again. Simon, what was your takeaway from the interview with Helen? Well, she's someone we've been hoping to get on the podcast for a while, so I was very pleased that we were able to interview her. I read H.S. Hawk the year it came out, I think, and I found it uh, very powerful and very beautiful. So it's great to talk about that book and the process of bringing it together and then also her her kind of drastic change of direction with this new project um which we did the interview a while ago and it's, it's been um good and heartening to see that that has been well received um rachel what about you agreed i thought helen was a funny and and lively guest uh, i enjoyed the conversation very much i wanted to ask more about form and grief and and the process of uh of putting those uh, words together on the page um, but I enjoyed her metaphor in terms of staying motivated that it's like wading through treacle and um, yeah anyway I thought it was a, it was an arresting image uh, what have you been up to Simon? I've been today talking to a man who's hopefully going to build me some shelves which is one of my favourite uh, favorite things to do so that has been interesting and also, one of your favourite things to do is to talk to men who are going to build you shelves yeah yeah what could be more exciting than commissioning shelving you know, there's so many interesting issues. To be fair, that is quite exciting. It is quite exciting. Yeah. Like, you know, issues of depth, material, adjustability. Um, I'm not. I hope you're going for, was it four well, degrees? I was just going to say, I'm not, I'm not going, I'm not going for an angle, I don't think, because they're not, it's not for display or commercial concerns such as that. So, um, so I'm looking forward to, to that because my, my books or as my girlfriend puts it, my friends are currently in storage and, um, I think it's time for them to be rescued. Uh, and in fact, we can talk about this now, can't we? So we've been, we have recorded the audiobook version of our book, which is very exciting and which you should have heard a little ad for. So that's, that's coming out and we're very much looking forward to that coming into the world. And then in, Matters Cultural, our, our cultural digest. Uh, I've finished this big French history of art book that I was reading. Uh, and I'm now reading a, a book called Racing Weight, which is about uh, nutrition for endurance sport, which um, I'm sure is, is there are some listeners, although perhaps not that many who are interested in that. Anyway, Rachel, what about you? What have you been up to and what have you been consuming? Well, what I've been up to, I think hopefully this, uh, hopefully the book gives some context for my slightly rubbish responses to this question <laughs> earlier this year because we we spent a, uh the first probably six months of this year working on it right and then yeah. um and we couldn't tell and anyone it, so. and it couldn't tell anyone and it consumed quite a lot of time so <laughs> i had been working on things but i couldn't talk about them so what have i been up to obviously i'm back from holiday i did lots of reading there i read a book called monsters by claire dederer which is about art that we love by problematic figures and what we should do and how we should feel about it, which was interesting. Did you read Night Night Bitch? I looked that up after. I you, did you read Night Bitch. Yes, which is about a woman who who can changes into a dog after dark. She turns into a dog, yes, but then sort of turns back and becomes a sort of half dog, half woman. Easily done. And in the end, it's sort of a piece of performance art. It was interesting. It was very funny, but I was um, 
on my holiday, I was with a big group of people and it elicited some sort of quite amused responses. Yeah, so I read that um, and I read Claire Keegan's new short story called So Late in the Day and I read Paris Echo by Sebastian Folks. So lots of reading. Anyway, this has been Always Take Notes, hosted by me, Simon Aikham. And me, Rachel Lloyd. Our producer and social media editor is Artemis Irvin. Our score is by Jess Danheiser, and our graphic design is by James Edgar. If you'd like to follow us on social media, we're on Twitter at Take Notes Always. We're on Instagram at Always Take Notes. If you'd like to support us on our crowdfunding page on Patreon, we're on there under Always Take Notes. And if you'd like to leave a review on iTunes or get in touch with us via our website, please do. Many thanks. Goodbye. Thank you.